Okay, so I'd like to talk about both topics in one video, both depression and anxiety. The reason for that, um, yes, there are a lot of different anxiety disorders. Um, there are a few different types of depression, but more often than not, um, depression and anxiety, especially like generalized anxiety, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Before I begin talking about those specific diagnoses, I wanted to add a little more to the assessment process just to add a few things I haven't mentioned yet. Um, when we talk about medication, a lot of times um, doctors don't really know what they're taking, the client is taking uh, over the counter, like psychiatrists, or uh, they don't know what people are taking over the counter, they don't know what other doctors have prescribed, and that's a problem. We want to get uh, a comprehensive list of everything that a client is taking. Another thing is that a lot of clients have been in the system for a long time, and they take, they were prescribed one medication years ago, and uh, then that medication was changed, or a second medication was added to it, and then they go to a different psychiatrist or a family doctor, and they are prescribed an additional medication that deals with the side effects of the first two medications. So, you know, there are so many ongoing changes and additions in their medical history as far as medication. It is really important to, um, to not only understand those changes, but when you see a client for the first time and perhaps refer them to a psychiatrist, it's important to realize that the person you are seeing and evaluating, assessing, you are assessing that person on medication oftentimes. Sometimes they're not on any medication, but a lot of times you're making a judgment, um, a professional diagnosis, based on somebody who is on medication. So if I find a client, if I get a new client that is, uh, that's been in the system for a while, even a child who's been in there five years and have been on and off of medications, um, oftentimes I want to get what is called a baseline. A baseline is what is this person like not on any medications? You cannot just take them off of medications. I refer them to a hospital setting, an inpatient treatment program, or just a hospital setting so that, number one, they're monitored. Number two, the any withdrawal symptoms are covered by physicians and psychiatrists. And uh, so you want them to be monitored and observed just in case they are suicidal or there are problems. Um, and uh, you want it to be at least a 14-day, well, 10 to 14-day program. Um, so even when they go home, you want to make sure they're safe. Safety, causing no harm to a client, that's, that's the number one thing. But you want them to be observed without any medications. And you want those medications to be out of their system. Um, and then you want a fresh diagnosis uh, based on what professionals are seeing at that point. And you want to start from scratch uh, with, with any new medication. 
a lot of times people have been in the system and on so many different medications and those medications have been changed and then the side effects have been treated that it is just a lot to consider. Remember, we are not medical doctors. It is important to refer them to an inpatient treatment program or a hospital that deals specifically with psychiatric medications. It's important that they are observed and monitored for their own safety and well-being, that they get a new baseline over, you know, a bit of time, and, uh, and then a psychiatrist, not a family doctor, should prescribe and monitor any new medication. Um, I think that uh, that's the main thing that I wanted to add. Um, so with that being said, uh, for this week, uh, I included the sad person scale a second week. Um, it is a very simple scale to remember, and it just helps people uh, therapists deal with clients or individuals who are in crisis kind of decide whether they have some suicidal ideation or not and it helps them to make a decision on who to call if to call things like that whether the client is safe or not the one that i like better though is uh, the mental status exam that includes suicidal ideation this is a mental status exam that I memorize so that if I'm at a restaurant and uh, somebody's having a severe problem and nobody is there to help while we're waiting for the EMTs, uh, you can do a quick mental status exam. Um, it's a good thing if you have a client in crisis. Um, you can report these things to a hospital, a doctor, an EMT, anything like that. Mental status exam, something that you should have memorized uh, so that you can access that information, those questions at any time. Okay, so let's look at depression. I want to tell you a little story. Uh, I tell this story sometimes in, um, in theories when we talk about Adler as well, but um, I try to be as empathic as possible with my clients. I'll never fully understand what they are experiencing, but I want to have compassion and empathy. Um, there was a point in my life where uh, I experienced a loss of my grandmother who acted as a caregiver. Uh, I ended a relationship, a long-term relationship. I moved to another state and city uh, without a support group. I started a stressful new job. All kinds of things were happening. And, um, and I was depressed. I don't think I was diagnosable. Um, but the one thing that that taught me was that um, I could not really imagine what my clients who are diagnosed with depression were actually experiencing. It was much deeper than I had expected. Um, kind of a all-consuming darkness but uh, but in theories I talk a little more about this but um, you know the one thing that helped me was Gemeinschaft Gefühl becoming involved in a community developing a new support network doing things for other people in volunteer organizations things like that and that brought me out of it um, but what I'm really saying is, it is hard to imagine what our clients are experiencing. Have as much empathy and compassion as you are able to. 
many people in history have experienced depression. Uh, if you read Abraham Lincoln's journals, he wrote to a friend in 1841, I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would be not one cheerful face on earth. Of course, he experienced a lot of loss and stress. Others have also experienced both depression and sometimes mania, such as uh, Handel, Hemingway, Eugene O'Neill, Virginia Woolf, Robert Lowell, uh, Sylvia Plath, she wrote The Bell Jar, um, eventually committed suicide. That brings me to one of the most important things. All of your clients, not just clients suffering from depression, but you always have to check for suicidal ideation. But especially, especially with depression. A differential diagnosis, how to tell what type of depression it is. Uh, depression is usually unipolar, so it's usually not manic. Um, that would lean more towards bipolar, both depression and mania. But it, it is usually in one of a couple categories. So major depressive disorder, a uh, person experience is a, a major depressive episode that is a discrete period of dysphoria that lasts for at least two weeks. Now the second category is persistent depressive disorder. Now this in the previous DSM was known as dysthymic disorder. Um, and so you may see that in a lot of files. They changed dysthymic disorder to persistent depressive disorder. That is at least two years of depressed mood for more days and not accompanied by additional depressive symptoms not meeting criteria for major depressive episode. The primary difference is um, the length of time. So you've got at least two weeks, at least two years. Um, and then NOS, not otherwise specified. When we think about symptomology and the clinical status, um, think about the severity, mild, moderate, severe, with or without psychotic features, chronic, catatonic, mel melancholic, atypical. One that um, needs to get more attention is postpartum depression uh, following pregnancy um, because of the differences, the changes in uh, neurological chemicals, um, postpartum depression is much more common and severe than, than many people realized. So symptoms usually develop over a period of days to weeks. There may be a trigger, there may not be a trigger. Um, it may be triggered environmentally, uh, even by a loss. Um, we talk about this in our grief and loss class, um, but it may also be neurological. Um, so it may include symptoms of anxiety before the onset of the major depressive episode or after where it may include anxiety. Um, the artifact theory maintains that men and women are equally prone to depression. However, it's more difficult to distinguish in men, or women may display more emotional symptoms than men. I don't have a personal opinion on that. I do think that, um, you know, uh, we need to look at men and women equally um, to distinguish the severity and uh, I believe that all people are unique and different. The hormone theory holds that 
biochemical differences may contrib contribute to depression of women. Um, I do believe that is the, the case when we are discussing postpartum depression. The quality of life theory refers to lower living conditions and the discrimination of women as being a contributing factor of depression. We talk about this as well as uh, anxiety in not only with women, but with um, minorities in the multicultural class as well. The lack of control theory maintains that women may feel little control over their own lives due to societal issues and biases. Victimization increases symptoms of helplessness and depression. Uh, trauma can increase depression. Um, and once again, not only women, but any multicultural diversity. Um, the self-blame theory indicates that women are more likely to blame themselves for perceived failures than men. Those are just theories that textbooks have mentioned that I felt may appear on some of your exams, so I wanted to include them in here. Um, the etiology. Prevalence of depression varies by age. Boys and girls are uh, equally likely to show depression during childhood. However, it's more common among adolescent girls. Uh, more have been diagnosed. There has been no show an increase in child and adolescent depression over the past few years. Uh, major depressive disorder is partially determined by genetics. Major depression is 1.5 to 3 times more likely among first-degree biological relatives of persons with this disorder. Increased risk of uh, alcohol dependency and anxiety disorder. Alcohol dependency would be a self-medication. 15% risk of suicide for this population. That's a pretty high risk. Individuals over the age of 55 who suffer from this disorder are four times more likely to commit suicide. Four times. When we talk about ages where suicide is more prevalent, the first is uh, late teens and early 20s. Um, the second is 55 and older. Um, and you can hypothesize why, what happens in people's lives during those ages. The younger age, think a little more impulsivity going on. The reduced activity of two neurotransmitters, uh, norepinephrine and um, belonging to the class of chemicals known as uh, catecholamines and serotonin, along with class chemicals, uh, indolamines, um, not sure whether I pronounce that right, but um, have been strongly implicated in unipolar depression. The axons of neurons containing these chemicals extend throughout the brain and especially to the limbic system, which regulates emotion. Um, that is why they believe that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, which do not allow um, reintegration or reabsorption of serotonin, uh, hence, uh, you know, there's more available serotonin. Um, they believe that is successful in alleviating depression, including uh, Prozac. Zoloft, Zalexa. Um, only fluoxetine, uh, Prozac, is the only current SSRI that's received FDA approval for treatment of children. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I've read a lot of studies on SSRIs. There may be side effects. There may be a black box warning. 
Um, one theory is that yes, uh, they may help prevent suicide, but they also could lower uh, inhibitions, which would increase impulse. Uh, so if somebody thinks about suicide before taking an SSRI, they actually might follow through after taking an SSRI, especially a teenager. However, even though this has happened, um, they still believe that if somebody is suicidal, if they are monitored appropriately, there is more benefit than detriment. Um, so studies that I've read um, usually show that they compare somebody who is experiencing a major depression over a year, like they'll take an SSRI for a year and they'll compare that to a control group not taking it for a year. And usually over a year, the results will be the same with or without an SSRI. Here's the, here's the interesting thing. When combining CBT and medication, that is much more successful in reducing depression uh, for children than either medication alone or time alone. And of course, therapy alone is usually more successful than no therapy and no medication. So um, take that with uh, however you like. Um, one thing I can say for sure is that the one constant in the studies is that um, therapy is more successful than no therapy. The other thing I want to say is that there are a lot of studies on CBT uh, it's a very measurable, uh, short-term therapy. Um, I've treated a lot of individuals suffering from depression, and um, CBT does work with some. However, uh, after you've done CBT, if they are still depressed, then what? And that's when you want to look at kind of theories with more depth that look at kind of a, you know, a deeper issue that people are struggling with and maybe combining CBT or REBT with existential theory where if people are feeling helpless and meaningless, uh, helping them to find meaning and motivation while uh, dealing with negative self-talk and irrational thinking. That's, I found that to be a pretty powerful combination. One thing I also said in my theories class was that people suffering de from depression often focus on the past. People suffering from anxiety often focus on the future. What neither one of those groups is doing is living in the present. Let's look at anxiety, phobias, and panic attacks. Uh, a little bit of history, anxiety, and fear can be beneficial in that they prepare us for the fight or flight reaction in a dangerous situation. However, if the anxiety is not reasonable, continues for an excessive amount of time, and interferes with one's life functioning, becomes the anxiety disorder. Freud was one of the first to speak of anxiety, <clears throat> excuse me, of anxiety and neuroses. He believed that an individual's defense mechanisms were incapable of preventing or reducing intense anxiety aroused by unconscious conflicts. I have in my office at Cal U the Phobia pop-up book, 
There are so many different phobias, phobia being the Greek word for fear, fear of germs, fear of, I'm wondering how, um, how this epidemic is affecting that, that phobia, this pandemic with COVID-19. I imagine it could be quite anxiety producing. So the pop-up book might have a dentist, it might have a very close crowded room, it might have a dirty bathroom if you're afraid of germs, um, clown, that's one of my phobias, don't like clowns. So phobia refers to a persistent and unreasonable fear of a particular object, activity, or situation. People suffering from phobias may become fearful if they think about the object or situation that they dread. Most are aware that their fears are unreasonable, and many may not remember how their fears began. Um, some do remember how their fears were originally triggered, but most people realize they are unreasonable and yet still experience the anxiety. So fear is linked with anxiety, or anxiety is linked to fear. Often it is fear of the unknown. Uh, now phobias are linked to a specific fear. Generalized anxiety might be fear of the unknown. Um, due to the symptoms of a panic attack, such as shortness of breath, heart palpitations, chest pain, discomfort, choking, smothering sensations, Many people believe that they are suffering from a medical condition. They're first admitted to a hospital. Conversely, genuine medical conditions must be ruled out first, such as mitral valve prolapse or thyroid disease. But, uh, but here's the thing. People might have a phobia, and then they have a panic attack. The panic attack is such a severe physical reaction to that phobia or fear, they believe that they might die. Um, so then the fear becomes having another panic attack, so it becomes cyclical. Let's look at the differential diagnosis. Generalized anxiety disorder characterized by at least six months of persistent and excessive anxiety and worry. So worry is connected with anxiety. You've got anxiety, fear, worry. Anxiety disorder due to a general medical condition. Um, these are subcategories, substance-induced anxiety, anxiety disorder not otherwise specified, agoraphobia, literally fear of the marketplace or larger spaces, specifically anxiety about or avoidance of places or situations which escape might be difficult or embarrassing or large crowds. Um, may also be a situation where Help may not be available in the event of a panic attack or panic-like symptoms. Social anxiety disorder or social phobia characterized by a marked and persistent fear of social or performance situations in which scrutiny or embarrassment might occur. Specific phobias, fear of clearly discernible circumscribed objects or situations, it's one of the most common and most untreated anxiety disorders. Um, most phobias fall into five categories, but there are literally thousands. Uh, animals, natural environment, blood injections, injuries, specific situations, or stimuli. Panic attack is a discrete period in which there is a sudden onset of intense apprehension, fearfulness, or terror, often associated with feelings of impending doom, 
During these attacks, symptoms such as shortness of breath, palpitations, chest pain or discomfort, choking, smothering, fear of going crazy, losing control are present. These are dangerous if people are driving or working with machinery. Let's look at the etiology. State of stress has two components. There's the stressor, the event that creates the demands, and the stress response, the idiosyncratic response to, uh, to, de to these demands. Um, one's response to the demands is regulated by one's appraisal of the stressor. A lot of it is in our minds. Uh, in the primary appraisal stage, a person interprets a situation to be either threatening or safe. Uh, in the secondary appraisal stage, a person decides on the type of response that's needed, whether or not he or she has the ability to cope with the threat. Fear is a package of responses. It involves physical, cognitive, and emotional reactions. These features of fear are generated by the autonomic nervous system, the ANS. Uh, it's a network of fibers that connects the central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord to other organs. Helps to regulate involuntary activities, breathing, heartbeat, blood pressure, perspiration. The brain interprets an event as threatening. It excites the ANS fibers. This is also known as the sympathetic nervous system or the fight or flight system response. Uh, because the nerve fibers are sympathetic to our emergency needs. After the threat passes, the second set of ANS fibers, known as the parasympathetic nervous system, returns the body processes to normal. Think about it this way. Um, if we respond to a phobia, even though logically we know it is irrational, and we respond that this is a threat, our entire nervous system kicks in. The ANS works in part using the endocrine system. Turn releases hormones such as corticosteroids, which actually stimulate specific organs and parts of the brain. Um, I want to give you just some, some terms here to remember. Uh, individuals' general level of anxiety is referred to as their trait anxiety. Variations of that are referred to as situational. Um, socioeconomics and real threats from society can play a major role in anxiety, especially with minority populations or populations that experience prejudice. John Watson, a uh, pioneer in the behaviorist movement, first used conditioning uh, with Little Albert and the White Rat. Uh, I go into detail in this uh, in our theories course. Um, it was then generalized to all furry creatures, including Santa Claus's beard. Uh, Albert was never desensitized. No follow-up was done. Um, but I will tell you what happened in the theories class. Um, Skinner used operant conditioning. Individuals are rewarded by reduction of anxiety through the use of avoiding behavior. Uh, let's see. I want to talk about treatment here. Um, So let's talk about phobia and panic attack therapies. Um, so Wolpe, W-O-L-P-E, um, he uh, worked with uh, other theorists, came up with two different systems. The first one he came up with was stress inoculation, and that was three different ways to relax. Uh, breathing, deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, muscle relaxation, and cognitive imagery. So combining those three things, 
helps the person to relax. When you use them with his other treatments of systematic desensitization um, or exposure treatments, uh, you know, it's a really nice combination of treatment. Uh, flooding courses, uh, exposure over a long period of time, um, and that would have to be cleared by a medical doctor. Um, but uh, other types of desensitization, whether in vivo, which is live, or just desensitization, um, which is imagined, uh, gradual uh, over time um, to the stimuli, and then pair that with self-talk and stress inoculation, it will help people overcome phobias. Um, I think that's all I want to cover right now. Those are the primary topics with depression and anxiety disorders. If you have questions, please include them in your posts.